the Globe Music Academy is a, a, a project initiated in Berlin 10 years ago. Um, the idea behind it was to start a degree program in Berlin um, focused on the different musical cultures of the world. Uh, we've had a real struggle to get it going. We have a Berlin building now given to us by the uh, district of Kreuzberg. Um, it's a very large old school building on the Mahaneke Platz in Kreuzberg. Mm, but we've had enormous problems with accreditation. Um, we've had to jump through all kinds of hoops, which I'm not really quite sure why those obstacles were placed in our way sometimes. Um, and we're still working on actually getting the degree program going. But as part of our international work, um, in 2009, we decided to look for African partners uh, to partner with the Global Music Academy in Berlin. And uh, as I come from South Africa, I realized that it would be quite hard to find suitable partners. And the Foreign Office in Berlin uh, funded a contact trip to, I think, six countries in Eastern Southern Africa, where pretty much what I suspected was confirmed in that there are no real music schools. And that the music that people learn in schools in Africa is a very strange 19th century version of European classical music that not many people understand and it's actually quite hard to understand why you would want to teach music that way even in Europe um, and to do it in Africa is almost ridiculous and so you have a strange situation that musicians in the whole region avoid music schools because they say there's nothing you can learn there and that the music that they want to study has no relevance or, or the, the music being taught there has no relevance to their own direct musical experience. At the same time, there's a lot of musicians who are very afraid about their musical traditions and their musical cultures. And I'm not just talking about um, people who play guitar or, or bass or drums or have sort of some knowledge of Western musical practice. I encountered extremely traditional musicians in Tanzania in a place called Chamuino who begged me to write down their traditions so they don't die. And they wanted me to come there and show them how to do this so that they could keep their traditions alive. And I heard this in many cases from traditional musicians. In fact, I would say the most the most innovative people that I met on that trip were actually people deep out of their own culture. It was them that were that had the most fear that their cultures were in were seriously endangered. So anyway, so we decided in 2010, uh, with the help of the German Foreign Office again, we we mounted a, a pilot campus to try and train or, or develop some ideas about how to develop a kind of education system that would do things differently. Um, and it was called, because we're the Globe Music Academy, we called it the Globe Music Campus. Um, and we invited people from different parts of Africa. Actually, in fact, the campus works only in Eastern Southern Africa at the moment. And we did a very intensive 11-day campus where we tested some of these teaching materials that we developed. And it was very successful. And then we went away and worked on it for a while and tried to get an EU grant and won it and then lost it um, because of a bureaucratic um, problem. And then in 2012, we had a sort of a stroke of luck that the, the Norwegian government funded a program called Music Crossroads in southern Africa uh, where there were, there, there's a project to start three academies, and they asked us to do the pedagogical work to develop the curriculum. And the Norwegians actually put quite a lot of money into this. And so through the Norwegian support, we were able to start doing a regular campus. And then I managed to get support from the, a, a small amount of support from the Goethe Institute, um, also from the GIZ, 
I got one time some money and I get a little bit of money from the Siemens Stiftung. But uh, although our project doesn't cost very much money, it's incredibly hard to find funding to, to do it on a regular basis. And this is just actually one of the major problems I found. There's plenty of money out there for talk shops. There's plenty of money for people getting together to discuss, to make plans. But when it actually comes to a, a functioning project that is really delivering, it's really hard to find people prepared to give you anything long term. I mean, a four year grant or something like this is virtually impossible, I found. Um, and corporate social responsibility doesn't seem to work either. I haven't found really much assistance in, in those terms either. So I think if we're going to fund projects like this, we have to seriously think about the quality of the projects and the efficiency of a project. And rather than looking for new projects all the time or trying to create new projects, look at what's already working and what's already happening on the ground. And this is a complaint I have from a lot of African partners, actually, that, that somebody comes up with a grand new idea wants to start a completely new project and invites people who've got very good projects that are actually desperate for money and can't get it because they want to start something new. Um, so anyway, so we've right now the, the campus gradually grew and uh, we now have nine countries involved, Ethiopia, Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, Malawi, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, and Madagascar, and Zambia as well. Um, and we've trained up the first group of teachers. We have a f the first year of the curriculum almost finished. In September, we're going to do the next campus, which will be the fourth, actually. And uh, the, the curriculum has been designed according to the European Credit Transfer System. ECTS it's called uh, and so ultimately the schools we're developing in each country or, or, we're, or the partners we're assisting to develop their schools uh, will be able to offer modules which the, the GMA and presumably other schools would be able to buy into as well so it could become a source of income for the schools um, in addition um, I think there's a possibility to, we've been approached by a number of schools associations in, in a lot of different countries. I think there's an enormous growth potential there for developing music education in schools. Um, something that's focused on, on African cultural tra traditions maybe, and in the broader sense African cultural traditions. I mean, I think also um, Africa is far more than just people playing drums or or singing songs, and there's a lot of very interesting music around there at the moment, and and that should also come into schools, because we've kind of found that this, also if you're talking about uh, musical traditions, what are you, what are traditions actually, in a way, you know, I mean, what is culture? That's another question for cultural <laughs> diplomacy, but people's culture changes, and p culture is often a very personal thing, and uh, this kind of blanket sort of name, uh, sort of, this is my culture. What is my culture is not the same as my brothers or my sisters anymore, uh, because I've lived a long way away from them. And I think this is the case also in in African countries. You're finding people with very diverse cultural backgrounds who maybe even come from the same family or the same. And yes, it's all sort of put under this one thing. African has a, Africa has a traditional culture, and this is it. And and I think it's a lot more diverse like that. And I think that a lot of our partners would like to see far more interaction with the world, but interaction on their own terms as well. So I think actually a good music educator, we were approached by the city of Kampala. We've been approached by two large school associations in Tanzania. So th there is a, an enormous potential. And I think the other thing about music education in Africa is that it's actually, you know, everybody talks about the music industry as a as a as a source of of potential income for Africa, which you could also argue that that is the case, but I think a far larger potential for economic growth is actually music education. It's a very neglected area, and it would provide a lot of work for a lot of people um, in schools. There's a there's a growing 
middle class all over the region that's very interested in having good music education for their children and this would actually actually help a lot to stabilize a lot of countries to give children a sense of cultural identity i mean culture in the very broad sense of it but but uh, i think it's something that we should look at it's a one important link in the value chain of 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 the music industry that I think is totally neglected. So I'd just like to round this up. I'd like to just show you a quick little film. I don't know if I can do this. Hello, my name is Groom Mazmur and I'm from Ethiopia. I'd like to introduce you to the melodic reading course at the Global Music Campus. <laughs> at the bass line from example 8.6 using the first time and second time bars. Example 8.6 using first time and second time bars. Now we can add 16 note pickups to the melody as in example 8.7. Example 8.7 with both the bass and the melody. Now let's put together the melody and the bass line.
arrangement with an introduction, A section, B section, and a coda. That was, that was one of, it's just a film, it's not really how we teach, but that's kind of an example of what happens. Those people had never read music before. That was after 11 days of running the program with them, and they were all reading that. So it's quite successful. We do a thing called a core curriculum, where we train um, core musical skills that musicians need. Um, the melodic reading is part of it. There's a thing called rhythmic reading and writing, and all the rhythms they learn to read, it's through clapping and, and, and singing, are all African. And then we do a thing called body percussion, which is a very interactive rhythmic awareness and coordination and, and rhythmic independence program. And then we teach them harmony, but we, we teach them harmony as a science because harmony is a science, it's not a culture. It exists in nature and taught from that perspective, it no longer is European. And actually the greatest harmonic developments in the last hundred years have actually all come from Africans interacting with European harmony in, in the Western world anyway. And people like Pichinguinha in Brazil, or the whole development of jazz, or everything like this was all actually done by Africans. So it's a thing that Africans are not really aware of is their contribution to harmonic development on the planet. Um, and then, uh, right now at this campus, we're starting to do the instrument curriculum. So um, we'll do bass, guitar, drums, keyboards at the moment. We're concentrating on what they call Afrofusion music at the moment because this is kind of the, m the market that is there for these schools. Um, at the same time, the, the, the teachers are learning to transcribe now as well in the next campus. And they bring materials into the campus from their own cultures, and we're collecting percussion rhythms, we collect guitar styles, we collect bass styles, we collect all it, like everything they decide to bring in. And out of this, we're creating a new uh, curriculum for them using the music from all their different countries, which is also like we, we've, we've got a real book now. It's called an African real book. In the music world, you have things called real books, which are originally the original. It was like the Hoover or, I don't know, like a, it, it was somebody called it the real book. And so all books full of tunes are called real books now in the jargon. So, so we've been developing an African real book where we've been transcribing lots and lots of music. And so this is also available for them to use in ensembles when they teach like this. And, and that's kind of the idea behind the program. Um, yeah, so, and the teaching now is done actually also more than half the teachers on the program are actually, uh, the teachers training the trainers are now African. And we did a campus in, in May just for 
East Africa, which where Ethiopia, Uganda, Kenya, and Tanzania took part, and all the teachers on that program were teachers already run through, been through our our program. So, and they're now training themselves, training more teachers. So, that's the kind of idea behind it. Okay, I think I've said enough. Thank you so much. You said that you started uh, ten years ago. Uh, do you think, w I want you to, to, to tell me about the outcome. Is it positive? Is it what you expected? And do you rec recognize uh, any uh, negative impact on the life of your students? Um, no, I, I haven't seen anything negative at all, I must admit. And the, this program hasn't, has only been running since 2012, actually, properly. So it's only in its third year now, in those terms. But we've had enormous success in the schools that are running, uh, they're, they're overrun. Zimbabwe is one of our biggest success stories. We can't, we can't deal with all the students that want to study. It's, the people are leaving the universities, the music programs at the universities to come to the school because they heard, the, the word has spread that there's something that's relevant to them being taught there. So. It's, it's been incredibly successful in, in many countries. We've had sometimes issues with bad management and stuff like that, but generally I think we have a really good, it's a network, they, they see themselves as a network, they identify it as their project, they spend a lot of time, I mean we have the Siemens Stiftung as one of our partners and that was, they were actually brought into the project by Madagascar, not by me or anyone else. So. And Ugandans play a big role. The Tanzanians play a big role. I mean, the, the, the countries themselves are, are very committed to the programs. I mean, the organizations within the countries. We tried to work with universities. It didn't work at all. Just as if you tried to work here with a university, it probably wouldn't work either because they're very hierarchical and they're very stuck in their own way. They have their curriculum. They have their way of doing things. And this is quite radical, what we're doing. And... So we found it just didn't work with universities. So generally speaking, we just looked for people with ideas and and kind of a lot of sort of strength of character and who are not really interested in driving a sport utility vehicle but want to actually do something. And when you choose those kind of people, you get very good results. So we also were thinking of expanding to West Africa as well. We've had a lot of interest from Sierra Leone, from Niger, from Ghana, from Senegal, but we don't have any money, so I don't know. Unless somebody opens that magic wallet, Mr. Wright or Mrs. Wright is here, perhaps today. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, you have just answered most of my question. My name is <laughs> Rahma. I am coming from Tanzania, and uh, I studied there Tanzania in primary school to the university. Yeah. And uh, it's very interesting to know that uh, there are people like you who are doing things like this, because it's true. I did like music classes in Tanzania, and as you said, it's very old fashioned, like 19th century. And I like to congratulate you to do that, and uh, I hope you'll be able to do more in Tanzania and the rest of Africa as well. So I wanted to ask you if you have any um, cooperation with the government. Maybe, um, maybe they support you to do the curriculum in the schools and primary schools, things like that, but you have just answered now. But the other question which I have, what about the music instrument? Because it's one of the very expensive things. How, do you, how are you able to provide these things to your students? Because and what type of instrument are you using? Because I have seen in your demo that it's only local instruments. Maybe, d do you have more? Thank you. Um, instruments is uh, one of the biggest problems, actually. Uh, actually, we don't provide instruments for the schools. It's not, w we're just actually doing, developing curriculum and training teachers. But the schools themselves all have problems to lesser or greater degrees. There's massive import taxes. In, in Malawi, those, those instruments you saw are, are a set of marimbas. They're made in South Africa. There's a, a thing called the Certificate of Origin issued by SADC countries, which is supposed to allow inter-African trade to happen without trade barriers. Well, the trade barrier in Malawi for those instruments drops from 25% of the value of the instrument to 15% of the value of the instrument. 
and the value of the instrument is calculated on the price you pay for them plus the cost that it that it uh, that it costs to to uh, bring them into the country. In this case, they cost thirty four thousand rand plus sixteen thousand rand just to get them into Malawi. So uh, the value is. 15% of 50,000 instead of 15% of 34,000. And it, it ended up with the instruments costing, in the end, in euros, 2,600. The instruments cost 2,340 euros, and we paid duties of well over 2,600 euros just to get the instruments in. We paid VAT in all the countries. You pay VAT on a product that is bought outside of the country with money that doesn't originate in the country, and you still pay VAT which is, I find, very strange. And most of the countries refuse to make any concession for educational purposes and uh, stuff like that. So instruments are a, a really serious problem. And they can do so much good, and it's very hard to persuade the bureaucratic systems there to, to, to adopt a different approach. Actually, Zimbabwe is one of the few countries that works differently in this regard. It's in many ways, for me, a model country, actually.